Um, and before we um, start and kick it off, and I will do some Q&A with Allison, um, in full transparency, I have on, you can't see it, but I have on type <laughs> A right now. And I um, wore type A well before I actually met Allison. So about, I don't know, a year or two ago, I personally um, went through this kick of trying to find a natural deodorant that worked. And um, I tried so many different things. And I was actually soliciting feedback from all the women at Third Love. Like, have you tried something? Like, does anything work for you? Um, because I just found they weren't really... Um, they didn't work hard enough for me. Um, and, and so then I stumbled upon type A. I don't quite remember how. Um, and it just really, really works better than any other natural deodorant that I've tried. Um, and then funny enough, I was at a um, conference last year. Um, and lo and behold, I get a tap on my shoulder and it's Allison. And I turn around and she says, hi, I'm Allison. I love Third Love. And um, I'm the founder and CEO of Type A. And I was like, oh my God, I love your product too. And so <laughs> we, we actually got to meet in person pretty briefly, um, but I'm a huge fan of hers. I know she actually wears Third Love as well. Um, so we <laughs> thought we'd have a conversation about what she's building and being a female founder and all of that. So um, with that, uh, let's get started, Allison. Um, if you think about kind of the landscape and you creating um, Type A, um, what was your inspiration um, to start this company? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'm um, not TMI wearing your product as well. I wear it every day. <laughs> um, and thank you for sharing that story. I just, I, it still makes me smile and, um, you know, so much love for your brand as well and just love how they fit so nicely together and love that you love us. Um, my inspiration for starting Type A was really about, you know, my experience, if very similar to yours. Uh, I was looking for an aluminum-free deodorant that um, that really met my high-performance standards. My background is in marketing in the beauty industry. So I've worked with lots of brands, big and small, and brought amazing products to market that were exceptional experiences that you just loved to use and worked in other categories. And I'd never, I couldn't find that in deodorant. And always having kind of a product hat on, I had an idea for um, – how to create a formula that really worked differently from anything else out there that was about being clean versus being natural and therefore delivering better performance. And so went after taking that leap of faith and putting this product and formula together and, you know, and brought it to market and we've been around for about two and a half years. So we're, we're, uh, we're just excited to be here with something that we think really solves for a need um, that a lot of people have. I do always say the best products and companies come out of someone who sees a need, a personal need, because you have to have such a passion for what you're building um, to actually make it work. So it, um, it's so awesome, so awesome to hear your founding story. I have to imagine um, like the trials and tribulations of developing a new um, a new deodorant are probably similar to bras, like pretty complicated. I don't know anything about CPG personally, but tell us a little bit about what was the hardest thing you encountered or what happened in those early days of product development that either surprised you or was a challenge. Um, absolutely. I think what is interesting and unique given my background is that um, that was actually the part that didn't intimidate me. I knew it was going to be a challenge, but I'd also done it before with other companies so I knew how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, really thought about this formula from a different angle and said, how do we mimic a time release? How do we, you know, and that can extend the longevity of the protection. We can create a sweat wicking effect. And that's what ultimately became type A's sweat activated technology and what makes it work inherently just very differently and, and a lot harder than a lot of other formulas. Um, it was really important to me that we own our formula. So I worked with a freelance chemist from the beginning. I had seen this in being in the industry that that offers you a lot of control so that we can deliver transparency to the customer. We put every ingredient, including the fragrance ingredients on the back of the label. That was important to me. Just really building trust and saying, we're going to do something, um, you know, at the highest level in terms of safety, in terms of performance, and in terms of like really having your back and, um, and, and doing things the right way. Um, so I was able to kind of control for a lot of those pieces just based on some of my past experiences. Um, super cool. And I was doing some reading, um, some articles about you and, and type A. And it's interesting because I 
that's such a distinguishing characteristic um, that really like the fact that it does really work on moisture. So it's interesting that that was like kind of the differentiating focus for you because it definitely comes through in the product. Um, so let's move on to something that's more positive, which is what, what are you most proud of? What do you, what, you know, what gets you up in the morning? You know, sometimes it's hard when things aren't going your way. So yeah, what, what, um, what's the most rewarding part about having started type A? Helping people. Um, this, when I had this idea and I'll never forget the moment where I really decided to go after, um, you know, creating this product and bringing it to market, I really felt that, you know, I want to help people in some way in my career from here on out, no matter what I do. And if we have a no sacrifice alternative to what you're currently using, there's no trade-offs, no compromises, and it works. Why wouldn't you make a switch? And if we have that, then let's make it as, you know, accessible as possible. So that's why we wanted to eventually be where people shop for deodorant at mass retail. And we launched at target this year, which was amazing. And like, we wanted to be accessible in every way. We're still online. We're on Amazon, um, accessible in very, you know, every way possible. But, um, yeah, that's what keeps me motivated is that we get this great feedback from our customers and fans that, um, it is doing just what we hoped. Like they, they, they're making a switch. They can stick with it. And then they feel really good about it. It's one healthier choice in their life. Love it. Um, and so cool that you're now in Target. So it's such, a, su such an awesome um, launch for you guys and partner. Um, so we're going to switch topics and talk a little bit about female founders, of which we are both part of that community, that it's quite, yes. still, <laughs> still quite small but growing. Um, so why do you think it's important that more women found – why, why is it important that more women found companies? You know, the more women involved in, as founders and entrepreneurs, the more we can shift the conversation and the dynamic. I think it's just really important because women, via you know, cultural or inherent, whatever reason, we think about things differently. I think we approach business differently. We just have a different lens often. And the more founders who approach business through that lens, um, I think the better. I think it just brings balance um, to to kind of business and corporate landscape and yeah it's a numbers game do you think a man could have created type a <laughs> a man would have done a very different thing um, we won't go down that path right now <laughs> i had to ask um okay and then let's shift here so what advice you know for for other women out there or younger women you know thinking about starting something um what advice would you give to them um, that's a great question. I think advice that I give is sort of also just fundamentally what I'm trying to instill in, in any young women and girls and my, in my daughter, like anyone I sort of, you know, we have access to is sort of to dream big, that there is absolutely zero limit. I think when you dream big, then you can go after it and you can figure out how to make it happen. Women are naturally, not to say men aren't, but I think we tend to be very resourceful. Um, and I think when we can really build grit and resilience at a young age, then girls and women can see that there's absolutely nothing that they can't do. And there's that lowers the um, sort of barriers to entry, the intimidation factor just all goes way down. And then more women take a leap. Yeah, I think that idea of having positive role models um, and role models across every kind of industry is so, so important. You know, really being able to see somebody who's similar to you um, succeed and build something is, is totally crucial. Um, so I want to jump into your product development. Some of the things that I read is very interesting, and it sounds like you spent a lot of time on even thinking through, you know, the design and the name. Um, funny enough, I didn't really quite put two and two together about type A until today when I was reading and I was like, oh, the name, now it all makes sense. <laughs> I'm like, where have I been? It's very obvious. But anyway, neither here nor there. Um, but tell me a little bit about how you chose that name and then a little bit about product design because the, 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 um, the product itself has a pretty unique feeling to it, I guess I would say as a consumer of it. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you thought about the name and the design. Absolutely. So the name first, the name came out of, I created a formula first. And then I want, I said, okay, we have a formula that does everything I want in terms of a performance perspective. Now we're going to innovate the packaging around it. And we're going to find a pack that 
is fun and easy and fast and clean to use. And those were kind of the four, you know, pillars. And we found this tube and this tube out of a hundred packs that I looked at was all of those things. And so it's not, again, going to be a sacrifice from trading from a stick to a tube. You might even like it better. And it turns out that people do, which is amazing. Um, so then we have this great product here. And I was like, what do we call it? And when thinking about the product, it works hard. It has your back. It doesn't give up. It doesn't quit. It's overachieving your expectations. This is type A. And that was how the name came up. And really what cemented it, and I remember saying this to someone was, you know, even if you're not type A, don't you want your deodorant to be type A? And once I said that out loud, I was like, that's what we're calling this. That's so cool. And how do you develop the fragrances? So the scents, um, how do you think about those? How do you name them? Like, how do you, how do you even think through what you should offer? And how many then, do you have today? Because you've been adding some, I think. We have, we have. So we have six scents and then a, and, and a fragrance free for those who want that. And then we'll always have that. Um, you know, the naming part is very fun. Uh, what we really wanted to do was also sort of turn the conversation around on type A. Type A can be about setting, you know, high bar and exceeding expectations. Type A can also be a force for good. And, you know, there are so many wonderful personalities that also embody type A, but embody, you know, driving positive change and, and believing and vision, dreamer, you know, being a visionary, all of those things. So that's, that's like we, we extended the brand into the naming convention. Um, how do we pick the sense? And then how do we, the names are just, you know, the most fun team brainstorm. And I think everyone gets in on it and has a good time. Um, and it, it's really hard to choose the end of the day. Um, the scents are something we put a lot of thought into. I just like everything with the formula, it all comes down to attention to detail. So we're just really nuanced in analyzing, um, in, in identifying what we want the scent experience to be, not a single note, but really kind of a, a more of a sophisticated, more of a, um, you know, a rounder experience. And then we have an amazing fragrance um, house um, partner that we we found over the course of time and has now been kind of our go-to. And they just, um, they get what we're trying to do and they can develop uh, natural, naturally derived fragrances that meet our standard. And also, um, you know, that are really, you know, immersive experiences. Super interesting. And then um, what's something that you've learned along the way that you've either been surprised at or has made you think through your product differently? Or something? Sorry about that. Um, I feel in technical difficulties here. Uh, what is something that I've been surprised at? Um, so I guess, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to more of the technical difficult, the, the, the challenges here that I obviously have also with my iPhone setup. <laughs> um, I think what, one of our early challenges that, you know, was definitely unexpected was in production. We actually had to make a, a change to our contract manufacturing partner early on. And, you know, to me, quality is, you know, most important. And in order to scale, this just, we had to kind of make a shift. But the whole process of, making a product in a lab and versus making it um, at scale. And then every time you scale up to the next size is um, very uh, complicated. And, and then I think a lot, that was something I just didn't have exposure to in my, in my career in beauty. But now in this role where I'm doing it all, I had to really rely on people I knew in my network who, um, former colleagues who knew what they were talking about and get a lot of advice um, because it was a, a bumpy road for us for a little while. Huh. Product development and manufacturing and production always never, never not a challenge, right? There's always something going on. In always the something. Always are scaling to your point and adding new products for sure. Yeah. Um, so as we think about sort of what we're doing today, which is the idea of women supporting women and, um, you know, helping, helping each other grow and scale, um, what, you know, what do you think women can do to help uplift other women in their lives, whether that's your friend, your colleague, et cetera? I think that's a great question. I think it's super important. Um, we, I think we can just be there for each other and really listen. Um, I try to, 
you know, in a personal and professional level, just surround myself with people whose opinion I really value and who I can be really honest with and who will be honest back with me um, and not just tell me what I want to hear. And, and I think that it's, that's a tough thing. And I think I've learned it over time as a human, as a female growing up, I'm maturing, but um, it's really important. And even when someone who I trust tells me something I don't want to hear, um, you know, there's a moment of like, oh, I don't like that. And then there's a moment of, but I need to hear it because that's exactly telling you that I need to listen even more carefully. Um, yeah, that's such a good point. I think that it, it's so true. It's like, there's one thing to be nice. And then there's one thing to be like a good, a good friend or a good colleague. And sometimes that means um, telling, you know, telling the truth, telling the unvarnished truth. And it's even more important with your closer network, right? The closer you are, the even the more important it is. But I know I found kind of the most inspiration sometimes from having those harder conversations, whether that's with a colleague or even like our board of directors when they're really pushing on something different, right? And this idea we're talking about a lot at Third Love these days is like the idea of continuing to challenge the status quo. And what that means is mm -hmm. challenging our status quo. We've already kind of changed the status quo for an industry. And now it's like, how do we continue to push the status quo? Well, it means pushing ourselves, right? Um, and sometimes that means doing things that make you uncomfortable or, or doing things that are different than what you've ever done in the past. So um, I think that's hugely important is, is, is that honesty. And then also for the person who's receiving that to be open to it, right? And to really yeah. look at that as um, an opportunity to continue to learn and grow versus like somebody, um, you know, versus it, it being a positive versus a negative. A hundred percent. I also think it's a lot in the delivery. So I think you can really, you can be compassionate and still honest. Um, yeah. And that goes a long way. We talk, we've been talking a lot about that internally on our end, actually. Um, awesome. Well, we are going to jump into Q&A. Um, we have some audience questions that I'll start on, but I have one more question for you before we start doing that. So if you're listening right now and you have questions um, for either Allison or I or both of us, we're happy to answer them. So type them right in and we'll, we'll get them going. And um, before we do that, um, tell us, tell me or tell us one or two women that have either inspired you or mentored you. I don't love the word mentor, but you know, you get what I'm saying. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear who those women are in your life. Yeah, I think um, there, there's a couple of women. Any woman who is advocating for equality or change or, you know, talking about the hard conversations is someone I admire. I feel like they're, I was actually thinking about this the other day. I'm like, there's, it's, it's a long list. Um, and so I would say, you know, public figures that I admire right now, someone who happens to be super present in my mind is Michelle Obama. Um, and specifically for, you know, how she speaks openly and honestly. Um, and then is able to leverage her experience to, you know, shine a light on issues that are important to her that I think should be important to our society and culture around kids and food and that, um, you know, personally, I, I kind of agree with you, actually, I think the term mentor can be very, like, it's, it's weighted. And sometimes um, I'm not, it's not my favorite term, but I have a lot of women who I've worked for who've inspired me and have been role models in my career. And I think everything I do, you know, in every position progressively is, is either a reflection of something that I liked the way someone handled it in the past, or I actively said, I don't want that. And I want to do things differently. And I try to pour all of that into type A to create a culture that's fun and collaborative and you know, supportive. And we work together as a team and, um, and, and reflective of all of the positive experiences I've had. Awesome. Um, thanks for sharing that. So I'm going to roll into Q and a um, coming from um, our audience. So the first question here is how does type A and third love view their competitors? How do you break barriers in the marketplace that is already established? Um, I can take it first and then Allison, you can follow up um, with yours. Um, so uh, it's interesting. So I think when I think about the competitive landscape in lingerie, um, it's, it's changed so dramatically over the past seven years since starting Third Love. So if we go back in time, when we started Third Love, B2C wasn't a term. Direct-to-consumer didn't exist. It wasn't even a term. <laughs> it 
So it's crazy. I know it's crazy how the world has changed in such a yeah. amount of time. And generally for the better, obviously. we won't go into all the ways it's gotten worse, but anyway. <laughs> and so really when we started Third Love, it was really about, you know, there being this option for women. It was like the idea of Victoria's Secret or department stores. And obviously that was really where the opportunity lied was to create better product, a brand that resonated with the modern women, woman, and then obviously the idea of being online was revolutionary at the time. Now you flash forward today and the there's so much in the world in, in every in which is you and your company, you know, you can't control yeah. others. So that's sort of how we do it. I'm interested, obviously, you have a different type of industry. But yeah, tell us yeah. about how you think about the landscape. The landscape in uh, the deodorant category right now, especially aluminum free slash natural deodorant is insanely competitive. Um, so it's a very present question. Um, I think so a, a couple of things, you know, we continue to be doing things very differently. We actually got a patent very recently on our formula concept, um, which is crazy and, um, but also amazing. And so on the one hand, I think, you know, it's, it's reassuring, validating, and we hope, you know, also a tool for us to be able to continue to stand out as differentiated in what is a very crowded landscape. Um, but it, um, you know, now that D to C is a thing, um, the, it, it's very easy to, to get a product out there. Um, especially kind of in our category, if you just want to create a version of something that exists already with a different kind of marketing and branding spin, you can do that pretty easily and it creates a lot of noise. So our challenge is more about um, cutting through that noise and cutting through the clutter and really, you know, being able to help guide and educate consumers that there are a lot of things that look different but are really very similar and that we stand apart is actually functioning very differently. Um, and just that there is an option, but just helping to, um, to, to sort of delineate or <laughs> categorize the, the options out there. No, it's, it's going to be a continuing challenge and evolution because I think that um, the D to C landscape itself is changing and the ability to reach consumers is shifting and changing with a lot of the regulation happening um, around you know, privacy regulation and ability to advertise. I think that's going to actually fundamentally change again how easy or maybe less appealing it is to bring any new product to market and that you really have to have a lot of um, points of difference and um, in order to uh, to to have a, a better shot absolutely um, so a another question here is um, both of your companies have grown rather quickly since launching how have you had to pivot or change your way of thinking to keep up with the demand for your product um, and I can take this one I mean I think that um, for us, it was a lot harder, harder in the early days of Third Love because demand was so unpredictable and growth was unpredictable as well. I think over time, you just get better at forecasting and better at seeing certain signs. Um, so for us, it's really been about that balance between having enough inventory but not too much inventory, um, which, is, which is just you're always walking that tightrope. Such a uh, challenge. <laughs> right? Like, you, you know, it's always, and it, it, it tends to, at least for us, it always, it's the start and stop of that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just kind of the natural um, way that we've gone through growth. Um, but I'm interested to hear your perspective as well. Yeah, no, it's um, inventory planning and forecasting is a huge challenge. And, and it's exactly what you said. Um, when you're so new and so young, um, any major event can skew things really dramatically. So something that we could absorb if our baseline were 10 times higher, you know, wouldn't swing as much. Oh, we're over skewed by a couple thousand units, no big deal. But no, that's an entire run and a year's worth of supply on this small skew, huge deal. So they also don't have a his any history, any reference. I can't look back five years and say, okay, what's our average growth and sort of like, you know, normalize some of the big, you know, jumps or dips 
um, we're very much in the thick of that challenge right now. I would I, say I feel like we're getting like this much better. <laughs> so. I was going to say, it gets, it gets slightly easier, but not that much easier. Um, so the next question is a good one. I like this one. Um, how, di how did or have you dealt with rejection and receiving a no? I can take this one first, and then I, I'm interested to hear your perspective. I think that in the early days of Third Love, when I heard no or experienced rejection, a lot of times from investors, it like tore at my soul. It was like soul crushing. I don't know how else to describe it. Like to the point where it's just you, you mentally, it's really hard. And then at some point, you got to get fixed in. You got to learn how to hear no. Um, and, and to me, it was really about reframing it so that I basically would say, anytime I hear no, I want to know why and I want to learn from it. So I mm -hmm. really went into like started going into investor meetings being like, likely they're going to say no, but my goal is to understand what I could do better or learn something from them about why there's the no and potentially like bring that back to the business to make it better. So kind of spinning it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'm interested to hear from you. I think that's actually a really smart way to look at it. And ultimately, I think different journey, but same result is every no ends up becoming a learning of some sort. Um, and then some no's are just, you know, it's a good thing that didn't work out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think the, the way I handle no is um, for me, it's about finding control in the situation and a path forward. So like when I get a no, um, if I can reframe that in my head to say, okay, this door is closed, but these doors open, these windows open, I'm totally mixing that metaphor. Um, but like, if I can reframe it and find, okay, how can I, um, how does this put us down a new path? What are the opportunities that we can look at because we're not focused here anymore? Um, it just helps me mentally uh, to, to come around to it. But I think it's the same thing as sort of learning from whatever that is and applying it going forward. Can you believe it? 30 minutes is up. So this is the last question. Um, and then we'll close it out. But how has your business changed during the pandemic? Oh, um, you know, good question. I think so. True story. People are wearing less deodorant. This is like a real thing. It is surveys and numbers have proved it out. It was in the there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal about overall, you know, use of personal care. Um, but they're not not wearing deodorant and they are focused on wellness. So, you know, our business um, has shifted in terms of like orders of um, magnitude, what's, what priorities are, what's important. So, you know, Target and launching in Target has been a huge focus for us this year. But with the pandemic, while that's still important, we're shifting attention to online channels, Target.com, but also our Amazon and D2C businesses. Um, we're also really working and connecting with, um, with our current customers, with new customers, um, really telling our brand story, um, you know, we have a lot of truth and honesty in what we want to do to set the highest bar possible for safety, again, without compromising, but just safety is a very present conversation right now. So that has been a conversation we've been able to enter um, and, and um, be part of. Um, I, I, that's a super interesting stat that I will take away with me today that people are wearing <laughs> less. I am not, but whatever. I'm just one person. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, this has been so fun. Thank you, Allison, so much for making time. It was really awesome to hear kind of the inside scoop, especially on product development. Um, so if any of your friends weren't able to join, we're going to post this on our stories and IGTV. Um, so thanks again for walking us through um, how to build a better product, how to support women, um, and all of um, the talking points that you walked us through. So thank you, Allison. Great to see you. Same. Thank you for having me and hosting. This was so fun. It was great to see you and great to chat. Same. Hopefully we'll see each other in person at some point in the next year. I hope so. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Take Bye. care. Stay safe. Bye.